Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us on this particularly warm day. Uh, my name is Sally Berkery, and I am the Managing Director of CEW UK. Sustainability is high on the agenda at CEW and, of course, across the breadth of our industry, from the ban on microbees to growing concern over single-use plastics. The buzz around clean beauty to the more recent blue beauty movement, it's fair to say that consumers are waking up to the real impact that their beauty regime and the products they choose to buy have on the planet and its future. And this has been further galvanized, of course, by the effects of the pandemic. The growing emphasis on sustainability has given rise to an exciting new generation of beauty brands that are generous in education and don't require consumers to compromise between efficacy, ethics and aesthetics. And yet the predominance of misleading claims and the lack of universal sustainable certification means that greenwashing is still rife. And as a result, the ability for beauty brands and retailers to communicate sustainability in a way that's clear, compelling and constructive is more essential than it ever has been. In this session, I am really delighted to welcome back Spring Studios, who will be detailing the five guiding principles for crafting sustainable beauty communications that capture consumers' imaginations and help to bring about meaningful change. And then Sarah Jossel, Beauty Director of the Sunday Times Style, will discuss these with Sally Ann Lim, Insights Director of Spring, and our guests, Sarah Brown, who's the founder of Pi Skin Care and Arno Messel, the CEO of Wren Clean Skin Care. There will be time for questions at the end, so please do use the Q&A panel rather than the chat at the bottom of your screen. You all know where it is by now. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Sally Ann. Thank you. So as Sally mentioned, we're delighted to be kicking off today's webinar by sharing Spring's latest piece on thought leadership, crafting compelling sustainable beauty communications in the age of greenwashing. And the format for today's presentation is really to share Spring's five guiding principles for crafting compelling sustainable beauty communications. Starting with number one, create a compelling and ownable narrative that is underpinned by action. It's fair to say that sustainable beauty is a hot topic with a deluge of both legacy brands and new entrants vying to win over conscious consumers with their commitments and claims. As our attitude and understanding of sustainability is evolving at pace, the challenge is really to identify that sweet spot where a brand's values and what, it, what is timely and relevant to consumers intersect. Those that cut through are able to craft narratives that not only resonate on an emotional level, but are underpinned by tangible actions and initiatives, successfully appealing to both consumers' hearts and to their minds. And two examples just to bring this principle to life. On the left-hand side, in March of this year, Unilever announced that it was removing the word normal from all of its products and communications in a bid to end discrimination in the beauty industry and focus on its positive sustainable practices. Spring is proud to have brought this initiative to life with a concept that redefines normality and underlines Unilever's commitment to doing good for both people and planet. Crucially, the positive beauty mission is further underpinned by several progressive commitments. The pledge to help protect and regenerate 1.5 uh, million hectares of land, forest and ocean by 2030 and supporting a global ban on, on animal testing and cosmetics by 2023. And on the right hand side, Biotherm's Live By Blue Beauty Manifesto is a call to arms, inviting customers to join them in the very topical blue beauty movement and explaining what it means to the brand. Beauty that comes from the ocean through the responsible sourcing of its life plankton hero ingredient and gives back through its commitment to ocean protection and reducing plastic waste. The brand actually first launched its Water Lovers Ocean Preservation Initiative back in 2012, which sees it work with experts and NGOs. And to this day, Biotherm continues to pioneer refillable and recyclable packaging solutions across the breadth of its range. Number two, appeal to the new skinimalist consumer mindset. Now, as Sally mentioned at the outset of this presentation, the pandemic has really prompted people to reconsider their beauty routines. One of Pinterest's top predictions for 2021, skinimalism, is all about achieving that paired back, healthy and effortless glow. And searches for natural everyday makeup are also up 180% year on year. Savvy brands are recognizing that this buy less, choose well mindset actually really neatly dovetails with the growing interest in sustainable beauty and are increasingly highlighting skincare meets makeup hybrids, which satisfy consumers' desire for both invisible coverage and more streamlined routines. 
As part of this, we're also seeing refillable products gaining in traction and sophistication across not only skincare, but also color cosmetics. And increasingly they're positioned as items that are kind of covetable that you want to keep and treasure as well as being good for the planet. With its clean skin centric beauty positioning, Ilia boasts a range of best selling multis, hardworking products with versatile uses that are part skincare and part makeup. They appeal to this skin minimalist consumer mindset with products that can be used to color and highlight both lips and cheeks, as well as a serum highlighter that delivers that desirable dewy glow alongside blue light protection. Ilia have worked hard to simplify and source materials that are safe for planet and also safe for product and are partnering with TerraCycle to ensure that all of its packaging can be broken down responsibly. And on the right hand side, from its inception, Victoria Beckham's eponymous beauty brand's goal was to create true luxury performance in the clean beauty space. The brand brings together a clean and lean approach to product formulation, responsible sourcing and sustainably minded design. In addition to its zero plastic solid brass smoky eye compact that you see pictured here, Victoria Beckham Beauty recently released its first ever refillable product, a covetable matte bronzing brick. Number three, be transparent and generous in sharing insight and education. Today, there are a plethora of interests that come under the umbrella of sustainability, cruelty-free, sustainably sourced, ethical, recyclable, refillable, etc. What constitutes sustainable is not clear cut as there's no one single universal certification and technology and supply chains are evolving at pace. As a result, 33% of consumers are struggling to understand which products are genuinely eco-friendly according to a report by Mintel. And 61% of women globally feel like brands are just labeling their products with clean beauty without any tangible details. Therefore, the challenge for brands is twofold be transparent, both in terms of progress and commitments, and increase education so that consumers are better equipped to make sustainable choices. REN's Clean Skin Care announced its pledge to become zero waste back in 2018, and also committed to being totally transparent about every step in that journey towards its end of 2021 goal. As CEO Arno explains, this is particularly crucial as from a consumer perspective, the changes actually aren't very visible. The product experience is the same or indeed it improves, but we are explaining as we make these changes, how and why components are now recycled and recyclable. And I'm sure that Arno will elaborate on that in the discussion to follow. Another one of our amazing panelists, Pi Skincare, are committed to raising awareness of the fact that sustainability is not just about packaging, it's end to end, encompassing the full supply chain. Driven by the belief that independent accreditation is key to bringing about meaningful change in the industry, Pi's founder, Sarah Brown, who joins us today and her team are super active on social, using it to educate consumers about the ingredient certification standards that they see on pack both what they mean and the rigor required in achieving them in a way that's really relevant, engaging and accessible. Number four, recognize that circular beauty can extend beyond category. We're at a turning point at which we recognize that no single person or company can bring about change at an industry level and yet every individual action is crucially important. The concept of the circular economy has gained considerable traction in recent years, based on principles of designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use and regenerating natural systems. Inspired by this, innovative beauty brands are embracing innovative and unexpected cross-category and even intra-category partnerships in a bid to make the beauty industry as a whole more sustainable. Spring works closely with Lumine, a Nordic beauty brand that have been pioneering the circular economy in beauty for over 20 years now, demonstrating the potential of cross-category collaborations by working really closely with the Finnish food and forestry industries. In fact, the majority of Lumine's potent Nordic ingredients are actually sourced from side streams of these industries that would otherwise just simply go to waste. And launched in April of this year by REN, the We Are Allies campaign defied industry convention by seeing the brand form an unexpected partnership with four of its competitors, Biosense, Use for People, Cordially, and Herbivore. The brands are united in making a zero waste pledge that states that all brands will create packaging that can be recycled and reused and that contains recycled materials by 2025. 
Vasiliki Petru, Group CEO and EVP of Unilever Prestige explains, it's true that advertising the competition doesn't make sense in traditional business, but the current environmental crisis calls for us all to do things differently. And finally, number five, make recycling part of your CRM strategy. I'm sure we'll all recall that over a year ago, Mac first introduced Back to Mac, a program that works to reduce landfill by encouraging consumers to bring back sits with its empty products for recycling in order to receive a free lipstick. Fast forward to the present day and innovative beauty brands are really underlying their commitment to sustainability by making recycling programs a key part of their customer loyalty schemes, rewarding members for their part in reducing plastic waste and not just simply for purchase. As a part of this dynamic, loyalty scheme members opt in to receive regular communications about the brand's sustainability commitments, helping to reinforce those shared values and keeping them top of mind. So two final examples to end, uh, the first from Korean natural beauty brand Innisfree, who are committed to, so committed to promoting sustainability that they've actually built it into the mechanics of their customer loyalty program. Working with the leading recycling company TerraCycle, Innisfree hosts recycling points in every single one of its retail stores. Loyalty scheme members not only receive points for every purchase that they make, but they can earn 50 points for each empty retainer they can each empty container they return for recycling. Although I must point out that this is actually capped at three products per customer per month in order to encourage conscious consumption of their products. And our final example today comes from Bare Minerals. Empty full-size makeup and skincare products from any brand are accepted as part of Bare Minerals Give Back, Get Back recycling program. Members of the brand's Fab Loyalty Programme can earn five Fab points for every item bought into participating Bare Minerals boutiques. Furthermore, proceeds generated by the brand's recycling programme are actually donated to help alleviate hunger in local communities, doing good for people and planet. And so there you have it, our five guiding principles for crafting compelling sustainable beauty communications in an easily screenshotable format. Thank you very much. And I'll now hand over to Sarah Jossel for what promises to be a really interesting and insightful discussion. Thank you. That was really interesting. And it's always great for me to learn so much. So really, really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I have been given brilliant questions that I thought there are, I mean, who wrote these, a lot of these questions? Cause they are, I mean, I need to learn a lot of this. So thank you for writing such brilliant questions. So um, the first thing that I wanted to ask you guys is um, the pandemic has served to underscore the critical importance of sustainability. And I think it's inspired a lot of people to reevaluate their beauty routine, as you said. Um, how has this affected you guys and your businesses um, and have you seen an evolution in your customer base? Because I think people probably went all over the place in their thoughts and decisions of what to do. Um, what sort of journeys have you witnessed? Who wants to go first? I'm happy to. Um, I mean, it was an interesting time, it still is. And I think it's sometimes quite hard to actually quantify this and, and attribute you know, what, what led to sales and what didn't. But as a general sort of perception, I think, my take is that COVID actually accelerated trends that were already happening. So I think, you know, a lot of the seeds of, of conscious beauty had were already germinating. Um, do I think they've massively accelerated in, in the last sort of year? Yes. And that's great in many ways. But yes, it was the, the sort of it, the beginnings were there already. I think a couple of things that we perhaps saw most was this renewed, I think being locked down and locked in makes you appreciate nature a bit more so i think there was a renewed um consideration of nature and that started as lifestyle of making your bread and planting your seeds but then it did i think it did translate into beauty and you know for us that played to our our values that we've lived for 14 years of organic farming and organic formulation and proving efficacy of organic formulation which um which is you know absolutely what we're trying to do um so i think that you know, going back to Spring's point about resonate, resonating on an emotional level, I think that did, that certainly helped us. And I think organic started to become maybe perhaps a bit more accessible for people and a bit more relevant to people. Um, I think the other kind of wider thing is around conscious beauty. And I think this was, you know, touched on in the presentation, but this notion of people really considering every purchase. 
and not necessarily from a financial point of view, but more about the gravitating to brands that, that spoke to them on a level, on a meaningful level and spoke to their values. And I think that's what, that's what we started to see. Um, and I think the brands that, that were rewarded and did well were those, those brands that were really clear in those values and embodied them. And I think Ren's a great example, actually, because you know, Ren's spoke, spoken passionately and consistently about the health of our oceans for many, many years, mm -hmm. um, which makes it incredibly authentic, incredible and real. Um, and I think it's like, you know, my advice is always pick your value and, and, and be consistent and embody it and, and underpin it with that action. Um, you know, asserting your something doesn't make it true. So that would be my summary. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. I know what about from your perspective? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, you know, I concur obviously with, with Sarah and on the skin minimalist um, trend, I think clearly the, the focus on the glow, a healthy glow and so on for us has been the explosion. You know, we've got a full range called Radiance on that and product like Ready Steady Glow. It's been, you know, we grew like this product on me by, 350% last year, wow. you know, so uh, there was clearly that less is more, less makeup, obviously, because, you know, lockdown and so on. And so need to have, obviously, uh, still your, you know, the best skin possible, the the, else, uh, the least skins possible. So focus on that. Uh, there was also, obviously, the, the explosion of online. So people were getting all these parcels, right, you know, at their home and so on. So clearly, that triggered also even more question and a lot of engagement around sustainability and packaging, outer packaging, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so we saw a lot of, of questions, you know, from our consumers on customer service, uh, you know, chat, online um, surveys, um, you know, social and so on, about how do I recycle? What do you know? Uh, who can I talk to? And, you know, challenge for us. You know, sometimes we discovered that, well, you know, we had packed the small products in a big box, you know, and uh, that happens, you know, these kind of things. Or... You know, or, or the opposite, where we choose a recycled uh, cardboard, which actually was not as uh, solid that, than the, than the non-recycled cardboard. So we had to change. You know, and there was a uh, there was some shortage of uh, recycled cardboard during the pandemic. So you know, it was there was a lot of problems. I mean, it still is. So so yeah, there was a lot of uh, you know clearly people had a you know their health and safety in mind. Obviously, I mean, it was very you know. So we. From, from our, our perspective, we, you know, the We Are Last campaign was planned for last year, you know, so we, 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 we waited because we didn't want to, 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 to promote that at that time when people, it was supposed to be launched in the 16th of April, 2020. So we did at the heart of the first wave, right? So we had to fold everything, but we worked in the background, you know, uh, to relaunch, to start relaunching all our key SKUs into sustainable solutions. And, um, and, 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 and again, there was a, the consumer response was, was amazing. So yes, more, uh, a more acute um, uh, awareness of the problems. People were watching a lot of Netflix, you know, people were watching all the documentaries about the planet and, and all these kind of things. And, uh, and so, yes, it was, uh, and I, I could see also, we could see, you know, we partnering with people like Planet Patrol here or Surfrider in the US, you know, these people couldn't do cleanups for a while because it was not allowed, right, to be outside and so on. And the minute, you know, things starting to reopen a little bit, people were on the beach doing the cleanups and so on because they, they needed also to do that. And there were, uh, unfortunately, a lot of new littering and new problems coming from the pandemic. You're so right about the um, everybody watching TV. I mean, my friends messaged me. They're like, did you see the vegan documentary? Did you see the sea life one? I'm, I'm going this. I'm going that. I was like, everybody calm down. But yeah, that, who's, I mean, it's true. The documentary yeah. did for that. Um, Sally, is there anything you want to add? No, I would just say purely from our perspective, we've definitely seen, you know, across the spectrum, not just in beauty, but in fashion and other industries, people coming to us more and more with the sort of challenge of how do we communicate our sustainability practices. I think historically they were often kind of confined to the sort of pages of a CSR report and you can't really expect consumers to go there. So it's, you know, that challenge of now there is that appetite. How do you meet people halfway in a way that's engaging, but critically make sure that it's not just a PR stunt, it's actually, you know, advancing sustainability in a really authentic way that's true to brand. Yeah, I mean, for me, obviously, one of the things I do is I, I look at new brands and I look at what their, their sort of their USP is and what their claims are. And it is so, you can really see it from a mile away when it is a PR stunt. And I always say, if it's not your thing, don't try make it your thing, just, just stay away from it. Because when you try, that's when you fall into hot water. So 
definitely agree with you there. Um, so one of the points that you touched on, Sally, in the opening presentation was about greenwashing. Um, and I think greenwashing is a great name because it really sort of puts a point on exactly what we're trying to tell people to avoid doing. Um, so, you know, with the rise of brands wanting to be more sustainable, we're seeing more greenwashing, more misinformation. How do you think brands can play a part in raising awareness and sort of educating in a more engaging way? Because I think people are nervous to sort of claim things. I mean, I know that I've written things. I'm going to use the word U-turn and I should not be using it anymore in today's world. But, you know, I found myself saying, oh, gosh, I, you know, I, three months later, I've learned that what I said Somebody told me that and I shouldn't have said it. And I'm learning on the job, I'm sure, like all of you. But how do you think we can sort of help rather than make it more complicated or sort of guide people in the right direction? Um, I know, do you want to start? Yeah, listen, Sarah, there's one point I want to make about greenwashing is that we need to be also, people need to be a bit careful about, you know, calling out greenwashing for everything. You know, I mean, it's a difficult journey. Let's be kind. You know, people are trying and trying hard. It requires courage, it requires investment, you know, so let's be, let's be, let's not put doubt on everything. You know, there's people at the moment, a lot of critics, a lot of talkers, not a lot of doers, right? So people are doing, people are trying hard and it's such a long journey. I can say we've done tons of mistakes. I think we part of the, of the brands are doing decently in the, in sustainability and we've done tons of mistakes. You know, we talking, we, we talked about what, some products being 100% re recyclable at the beginning. Well, guess what? Nothing is 100% recyclable. You need to be recycling ready. You know, that's because it all depends from where you are, your council, your, your, your country, your, your city, and so on. So there's a lot of things we had to adapt. You know, we've been accused of greenwashing, I think, okay, by certain people saying, oh, you're talking about zero waste and so on. You should not. First of all, back in 18, 2018, there were not that many brands talking about all this. Uh, there was a few brands, to be fair, you know, the Aveda, the, the you know, the, the, the big brands like this, uh, L'Occitane, uh, you know, uh, the Body Shop and so on. That's not that many. And we started to define what we believe was the always. So it's a definition. Okay, it's our definition. And we always called, uh, believe me, we, we belong to a big group where, you know, we need to be within the legal boundaries and so on. So we are put, take, put, take, uh, you know, uh, putting a lot of attention to the details. But... But yeah, nonetheless, people said, oh, you know, that's not true. Yes, well, we, we're saying that zero waste is about we being recycling ready, using recycled material, and, and, and all reusable products on all the range. And that's what we're going to achieve. We're not saying we're perfect. Some, some solutions that we thought were the best are not the best anymore because there's new technology. And that's the good news is that the, 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 there's a lot of money coming into the green tech, a lot of new inventions, a lot of new processes, and so on. So there's a lot of hope. Uh, but we started and a lot of people are starting. So let's not, you know, point finger right away about, oh, that must be greenwashing. I think, yes, some people might need to be more precise, you know, when they're launching a big, like, oh, that's the new paper bottle where it's a prototype, it's going to be ready in three years. So people should say that, you know, it's not always the case, right? So people need to be a bit prudent and cautious. Nonetheless, you know, the fact that everybody is talking about it, you know, I think in itself, it's a massive achievement for this industry. Thank you. What about Sarah? So I would agree with that. I, I don't think we had any idea how complicated packaging could be from an um, onward recycling point of view. As soon as you try and get into bioplastics and PCR, it, it is not plain sailing. And I, I completely agree with that. We have to make a start and we're not going to get it all right. And there will still be some compromise, actually. And that's just a reality. So, yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, my view and people who know me will know what I'm going to say, but... The way you cut through, I mean, greenwashing was bad when I started the business 13, 14 years ago. It's much worse now, I would say, just because there's just more, more brands in this space and that's inevitable. But I think you cut through it very simply by certification. We need to follow the food industry certification. And I think there's, there's talk about there's no sustainable certification. Well, actually, there is. And organic certification is so misunderstood. It's not just about how an ingredient's grown. It's how it's about protecting our oceans and not polluting our oceans. It's not, a, it's not about contaminating our soil. It's about protecting endangered plants. It's about protecting farmers. It's protecting communities. It's about not using the right, you know, certain plastics. It is total end-to-end -end supply chain sustainability. And that's what people don't get about organic. It's not about how an, just an ingredient is grown. So I passionately believe there is a certification standard that is 
absolutely fit for purpose and crucially fit for beauty. This is, we have our own beauty organic standard now. We didn't have that 10 years ago. We have Cosmos, it's brilliant and it's really robust. So I think certification is where you cut through it and people have to, um, you know, that point about you can't just assert you are something, you, there's somebody checking, there's a third party checking and, and in a very robust way, I can tell you we're auditors and it's, you know, pretty, pretty forward. But um, that's my view is that, 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 and that's what the food industry, you know, did, did really well and, and you can't make certain claims now um, unless it's true and there's been whole scandals around you know pr pr uh, eggs being coming from battery farms that were pr presented as free range that weren't you know that guy went to jail and was fined a lot of money but there was there's that scrutiny so my view is is that absolutely there is a way to counter a lot of greenwashing that is you know I agree with Arno let's be kind but where it is blatant you know there's okay. ways we can just address that mm. This isn't really, I'm just quickly going off topic. Is there any sort of like, sorry, I should never do this, should I? Um, but like mentorship or whatever, but like the big sustainable brands helping like new brands who want to want to like learn or like not make the same mistakes that you guys have like learned. Is there anything like that or not? I, don't, I just think it's well, quite we, interesting. We, you know, I mean, we talk about this later, but we, you know, uh, that's the intent of We Are Lies to a certain extent. Oh, you know? I mean, okay. I mean uh, for us, it's like, it's a beginning. And I know the, the you know, the British Beauty Council is doing that also, you know, starting that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of initiatives, but, and, and back to what Sarah is saying is, is that because on packaging, it's a bit complicated because, you know, you can do your, your good job as a brand, but that, then, you know, the products are put in bins, you know, and, and then it's about, you know, the collection, it's about the sorting and it's about mm -hmm. the processing of the waste. And, and there's a lot of people involved. And unfortunately, as brands, there's not that much we can do on the other side, but we can lobby, we can, you know, What's important, I think, is the facts, you know, giving facts and data. You know, for instance, all our zero waste uh, journey, you know, I keep on saying to the team, we're still at 68% on the website. <laughs> when do we move that, that gauge? We're in July. And they tell me, no, no, Arno, because it's based on the exact, you know, number of units that we're selling of products which are sustainable. And, you know, that's the way it is. And hopefully we reach 100%. They guarantee that to me, we see. And if, if not, we'll tell you. I mean, we tell everyone facts and data, really important. And the other thing is transparency. You know? And I think, again, we are in an industry which is so competitive that sometimes, especially some big brands or big corporations, they are a bit, a bit too you know, absolute in their claims you know, and, and so on. So no, it's, not, it's okay to be vulnerable. You know, it's okay to say that like, you know, typically when we launched these kind of, uh, of samples you know, two years ago, which were PCR samples, we thought it was one, you know, a great solution for samples. Actually, yes, because it's PCR, but it's not recyclable because they're too small. And you cannot recycle small plastic items today. So we have another solution now. But you know, two years ago, I should, I'm sure I've told you, Sarah, that that was a solution. And no, so two years after, I can tell you, no, the solution exists now because the technology was not existing. But you know, so it's recognizing that yeah, we said things that were, at the time, we thought they were true, but they're not true. For me, that's not green motion. It's just that, you know, we are explaining that, yeah, as Sarah was saying, it's difficult, mm. it's costly, uh, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of focus. And, you know, Sarah, like I, you know, we, we're running big brands, but small, you know, sm smaller businesses versus a lot of big businesses, right? So, so it, it takes a lot of time and focus and, and energy to do that right. So... Uh, and, and we're learning. It's a learning curve. You know, things yeah. that it's a, it's, a, it's a long learning curve. Well, can I just talk about the because you asked about consumer education piece, and I think that it, that's a really interesting question whether brands can do that effectively. And I think actually We Are Allies is a really interesting example because you've got five or six brands coming together saying the same message. That's amplified and that can have impact. Um, and I think we have to think about sort of the ecosystem of influence we can have as brands, beauty editors, opinion formers, um, you know, ex experts, influencers, all sorts that, that can just amplify this message for impact. And I always think about, um, I don't know if you remember the Hugh Burnley written thought, and I, I never know how to say his name, who did the coffee cup campaign and he, he sort of talked about how disposable coffee cups you can't recycle because of the laminates on them. 
and you know it was a it was huge and it made people think um and it was great and i think if a brand if a single brand had done that campaign and and it was a it was a um reusable coffee cup company that did that campaign would it have had that impact maybe not so i think it is this is a really interesting piece about education and where and where I think it comes back to authenticity and, and the authenticity of your values if it's been something you've been talking about for many many years it's authentic it's fine but I think if brands do it and it, they've never talked about something before and they start talking about it I think there's always going to be that suspicion in the consumer's minds of you know when a brand seeks to educate are they actually seeking to sell and it is so of this this real yeah. should brands try of course and, should, and it's more meaningful when you do it as a, you know, in unity with other brands, I think it's brilliant. Um, but it's just an interesting idea of how do we, if we really want to change the world, how do we do it you know, with all of the ecosystem of influence that we have? Yeah. Dalian, is there anything else on that that you wanted to add? No, I mean, I think I can only heartily nod my head and agree with uh, Sarah and Arno. Really, it is kind of honesty is the best policy and, you know, admitting that you're on a journey and taking people with you. And I think you're right about, you know, partnerships and, and where brands do have platforms, using them generously to shine a light on people who advocate for sustainability, sort of more broadly speaking as well. I think that can help to make it authentic so that the education speaks to sustainability as a whole and isn't always tied to product, which I think you're right, Sarah, can sometimes spark a degree of cynicism from people um but it's ultimately working towards that one overarching goal yeah sure. i mean i oh sorry, oh, sorry no one i go no, for please it Sarah. No, sorry. No, <laughs> no, no. i you. hate zoom <laughs> no well, all i was gonna say is that just you know as someone who obviously does not own their own brand looking at the the marketplace from a fashion and there was a fashion brand the other week that sort of just said you know, our first problem is we're trying to sell you things and we're trying to ask you to buy more. So we, we know from the beginning, we're not necessarily the most sustainable people that, it, you know, it is an absolute minefield from that perspective, but owning that and saying, but here's what we're going to do to try and help. And then listing the things and claiming what they're not good at yet. I just felt very connected to them when they did that, because I thought that they're, they're owning it. They're not great at this. They still need to work at that. And I also see it with our readers. You know, if you, if a brand is screaming about just the two things that are in it, ingredient wise, readers do now say, okay, but what else, like what else is in it? You, you sort of can't pull the wool over their, their eyes the way that you used to. You know, you have to just be transparent and say, these are the great things. These are the not as great things. And we just want to tell you straight. Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a point about also the, you know, it's about being consistent is, you know, I mean, for everyone is like, you know, people understand that from a product perspective, sustainability needs to be key. There's no excuse now if you're launching a new brand, you need to be sustainable because the solution exists now in 2021. You know, it was not maybe the case uh, 14 or 21 years ago, but it's the case now. So no excuse. Now, the other thing is that, you know, it's let's be careful with the, you know, what you know, the trends about what's cute sometimes, you know, like I give you an example about the mini fridge, you know, there was a the big trend about the mini fridge, remember, when you put your, your moisturizers and stuff, honestly, who doesn't have a fridge, you know, I mean, you know, you know I, mean, I mean, honestly, put your products in your fridge and don't, don't, don't create a piece of waste who's going to end up in landfill. And everybody got crazy about this mini fridge, you know, from everywhere. And <laughs> that's why I get good friends of mine and they, you know, like, hey, why don't you do a rain mini fridge? I say, why? Well, yeah. <laughs> and I explain, but you know, it's it's like uh, we. So we need to, because that's a lot of you know. So it's 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 stepping back a little bit. Say, okay, there's the product. There's an ecosystem around the product. You know, let's think about what we put in on the shelf in the stores. Let's put our. Uh, let's think about our shippers for online. Let's put about the shippers of our partners online and all these kind of things. And 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 step by step, to Sarah's point, education. It's B2C education with the consumer, it's also B2B education. You know, we've seen therefore in the US they just launched that, you know, the, the Clean Plus Planet positive uh, uh, campaign uh, today or yesterday. Uh, you've got Ulta with uh, Conscious Beauty in the US, you've got, you know, people are coming there. But, you know, I can tell you a few years ago, nobody was talking about it. But now also the key retailers are, uh, you know, doing this campaign. So I think it's great, but it's, uh, yeah, we need consistency is key. Brilliant. Uh, the next question we're going to talk about is 
I think if you look at the beauty industry as a whole, we can't deny that there are some very clear unsustainable elements to it. So sampling and packaging. I think, you know, there's, there's nothing worse than when you see somebody calling someone out on social media saying, can you believe how it's arrived? You know, th th there's all of that going on. Um, the only other thing I'd say is what I've been noticing during the pandemic is we've sort of actually taken quite a few steps backwards because people are so worried about hygiene standards that I'm seeing more wipes than ever before. You know, everywhere you go, everybody's offering them out, like clean, clean your desk, clean your station, clean, you know, everywhere you look, it's sort of become the norm again, which is really sad. It's taken huge steps in the wrong directions. Um, from your guys' perspectives, what would you say we need to do to sort of move in the right direction? Um, Sally Ann? Yeah, it's about reconciling that tension, isn't it? It's sort of almost the, the fashion analogy that you were using that sort of it's almost coming out there and saying, look, we acknowledge. I think it's it's recognizing that consumers have a choice um, and educating them to make that choice and that there are sort of more sustainable options. You know, beauty is a basic need that everybody has. And, you know, there's a real benefit to beauty, particularly through the pandemic. You know, that has been so critical to people to be able to have their beauty regimes. So I think it's just educating people and offering solutions that enable them to still enjoy that and, and you know enjoy the beauty of beauty but do so in a way that's a little bit more sustainable brilliant thank you what about you sarah i think the sample the sampling point is a really good one um and i think it it's probably been a bit of a blind spot for our industry i'm mean, great to see ren's taking really um active steps on that and i mean i think fundamentally sampling is is quite wasteful as a exercise anyway i mean often those sachets they stay stuck to magazines and they don't or they just they get handed out and not used so there is there's the challenge there i think one one very simple way of of helping not fixing but helping is just giving people the right to return much more and that way they can buy a full-size product and try it and return it um but they can do it with confidence it's about you know instilling that confidence and I think a lot of brands do that well. Um, we've done it forever because, you know, we're a sensitive skincare brand. People need to try our products. Um, that's really, really important. And actually, when I was starting this business, one of the reasons we did that was because I have very sensitive skin and I could never return anything ever. Um, so but so I think, you know, retailers need to come on board more. Some do it very well, but many don't that, you know, oh, you've opened it. Well, of course, I've opened it. I have to try it. So I think I think you know really making the right to return much more accessible, then coupled with you know um, more more eco sampling solutions helps. I, I agree with you though. It you know this the need for hygiene does set us back a bit. Mm -hmm. A quick question on the whole right to return, because then do we go down this road of people trying it, returning it, and then that's a way that product is sort of deem not not usable i guess how do you i get it that's what i find tricky about it um i think it's less of a problem than you think really uh, no and i think when i i remember when we we first i mean this is many many years ago we we first did this no quibble returns piece and we thought it would be really abused actually and yeah and i remember there was a, a contingent at cardiff university who would um clocked this and kept sending back empty completely empty bottles saying yeah we didn't like it <laughs> And or well, refilling it with water. Yeah, no, but we would just say to them that you, you're, if you know, please think about others because actually, if you do that, then we have to remove that and yeah. the chance overnight. Um, and we've never had an issue. So I think I think people return less than you think, and yeah. it gives them their choice. Um, and it comes back to quality of product. Mm. But to have confidence in the quality of your product. Brilliant. Don't I know, that. and his um, and the Ren big innovation incoming tell us yeah. all. so so it's been samples have been keeping me awake at night in the last four <laughs> years uh, since i've been uh, working uh, for ren uh, so you know as you as always you know as all brands for many 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 years we were doing sachets right 120 billion sachets every year from the beauty and personal care industry uh, 95 percent 99 percent end up in landfill and as you know small objects fly away, reverse ocean, and so on. So horrible, horrible, and yes, a bit the dark secret of the beauty industry. Not only the beauty industry, by the way, but you know, we're talking beauty. And so we tried, so first of all, we said we stopped. 
So it didn't, <laughs> it was not easy for other people. And yes, we did more returns and some, you know, uh, from, you know promotion, uh, as I was saying, because a lot of retailers saying, oh, you need, you need, we need sachet, we need sachet because otherwise what's happening? So three years, two and a half years, uh, that we, three years now that we stopped producing sachet. Uh, so the grant for us, it's like 5.5 million sachet that we saved from Mentor. And, and we found eventually this. So this, uh, and this is gonna be available for everyone because the people who are doing that for us, they asked me, do you want the exclusivity? I said, of course not, that's not the point. You know, so these people behind, it's called Tubex, T-U-B-E-X, X, you know, and it's a company and they can do that for everyone. Okay, we don't have the exclusivity. We didn't want the exclusivity, okay? We just wanted to be able to be the first to test it, okay? Uh, so we, we raised our hands and this is made, so it's a, so you see the experience actually is much better than a sachet because it's, it's a five ML, okay? It's an, a mini aluminum tube, which is made of 100% recycled aluminum because aluminum can be recycled infinitely, okay? And because it's aluminum, you know, it's gonna be widely recyclable. I wish I could tell you 100% recyclable, we can't because there's still some instances, but compared to plastic, and especially for an object that size, it's widely recyclable. Remember, the recycling industry after the Second World War has been developed for metal and glass, okay? Not for plastics and so on, and for big objects. So this is, so basically, is it a silver bullet? It's close to the silver bullet. You know, all the samples can be, can be used like this. So obviously, if you've got a, something very liquid, we've got another solution, which is a mini glass with an with a, with a, with a, with a aluminum cap, um, glass bottle. But this is, this can be available to all the brands that are talking to, to, these, to these people at UBX. We can give you, I gave the contact to the allies of We Are Allies, and we can give that to more people. All the people are interested. Is it more expensive than plastic? Yes, but it's, you know, the, the, the experience, you know, I had a, a very nice email this week from somebody very important at Sephora in the US saying to me, Arno, I just received your sample. I love the product. She, she was calling it the product experience. She said, I love the experience that I've got with that. And on top of that, it's great for the planet. And I think that's where, you know, thanks to technology, you can reconcile. There's no tension anymore. You can reconcile the product experience with sustainability. And I think that's one first step. And again, it's available for the beauty industry. Just have to call them. I mean, I think what you said there about product experience is everything because it's really tricky when you receive products and you know that the heart is in the right place and you know that they're trying their best, but when it's, you know, sort of squirting all over your hands or it's going a bit funny in the bathroom and it, it's very hard to recommend it because it's not a good product, you know, user experience from that side. So bring on aluminium sachets. Sachets <laughs> were always horrible to use and I can never yeah. open them. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Um, I am going to ask my last question. So just to say to everybody here, please do put your questions in the Q&A bo box. Ask anything at all that might be on your mind um, and these brilliant people will answer it. So my final question is, um, what role do you see partnerships and collaborations taking in exploring new approaches to sustainability? So I guess that's things like, you know, what do you look for in a partner? Um, and sort of what, I guess we're going to look at, we are... To, you know, talk a little bit more about We Are Allies, but um, what do you look for when you think about collaborations? Um, who wants to go? Arno, do you want to talk about We Are Allies first? Yes, I, I, you know, so, because, you know, We, we Are Allies, it's an idea which is, um, you know, I, I, somebody in a, for the launch of that platform called Loop, you know, from TerraCycle, somebody said in Paris when they launched it in July 2019, somebody from Carrefour in France, by the way, cannot remember the name of the guy, so I'm sorry, but he said something which stayed with me forever, which is collaboration is the new competition. So that person said that, not me. Uh, but I use that phrase a lot since. And, and I brief an agency in the US, in LA, fantastic guys, collectivists are working only for, you know, uh, ON, you know, uh, charities and, and organization, people or brands to trying to save the world and so on. And I, and I brought the, the concept of collaboration is the new competition. I said, okay, in the world of sustainability, can we find a creative idea? And they came back to me saying, we are allies and we explained. So we had the idea and then I picked up my phone and I called a few people I knew. Uh, and we were in the US, so we are focusing on 
on brands which were at the time, you know, uh, in the clean beauty uh, uh, category and sold with us at Sephora. And, uh, and I called all, the, all of them and after, you know, they, they cut me off after 30 seconds, hey, we're in, we're in. And, and I can tell you I had a knot in my stomach because, you know, I was at the list of the four brands <laughs> and I was, you know, ticking the box, but, you know, you know, because you don't know, you know, it's, it's true competitors, right? They're not part of Unilever Prestige, you know, it's true competition, right? So calling them and you don't know, I didn't know, I mean, I, I knew some of them, you know, I, I knew Mathilde from, uh, from Caudalie, a couple of people like this, but not, uh, not everyone. And, and then the reaction was so positive because, I, and I quote uh, Catherine Gore, she's, the, she's the, the, the president of Biosense, she said to me, there's a great sentiment behind this idea. Uh, and especially, you know, at the time, as it was pre-pandemic, huh? But, you know, the fact that, you know, the U.S. context, you know, uh, people needed unity, you know, uh, people needed to, to, to get together and to feel stronger together instead of being, you know, uh, separated and divided. So, um, and so, yes, we started that. We started to talk. So we were supposed to launch. We folded everything and we stayed connected. We became friends, just to be clear, <laughs> all of us. Uh, and we had this big kickoff meeting just before the pandemic in San Francisco in February 2020. And then we stayed in contact. We said, we're going to launch it because it's too important. And people were calling us saying, OK, are you doing your idea and so on? So, and so we launched it. And the response has been phenomenal. And what we're saying is that it's not a private club. You know? So since then, we received a lot of uh, uh, calls and emails from brands who want to be part of it. Uh, so we're just asking, basically, the brands to just let us know. Because to, your, to the point about greenwashing, yeah, it's a good idea. So you know, uh, you know, it needs to be real. You know, people who have signed up you know, for that initiative have credentials, they've got a proper roadmap, they launch products, you know, again, which are not perfect like us, but we're going, you know, there's a, there's a clear, it's action more than words and so on and so on. So we act, we, 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 uh, that's what we're demanding from people just to have, you know, to come with a plan. And we had brands from the UK, brands from the US, uh, brands from France and so on, who are now knocking on the door. So hopefully by the end of the year, we'll be able to announce, uh, and obviously Sarah, you're welcome. Uh, if you want to be part of it, uh, uh, you know, you, um, you know, we'll be an, able to announce a second wave of, of allies, part of this alliance. And the goal is really, you know, best practice uh, sharing, uh, trying to find better solution together. I can tell you, so typically, so we share this, this uh, sample ID. Um, uh, Kodali shared with us what they're doing with an organization called Second Life uh, in Indonesia, which is basically collecting as much plastic from, uh, from the, you know, in, in the environment that you're producing to compensate at least your plastic, uh, you know, your plastic waste. There's a lot of things like this. Uh, also, Kodali is very good that, you know, we're planting, uh, planting a lot of trees. They, plant, they, replant, they planted 8 million trees, I think, since the, in, in the last 10 years. So we've got the contacts. It's fast-tracking programs for us. Also, it's like, okay, this is working, this is not working, don't go there because it's a trap, and so on, and so on, and so on. You know, reading also all the fine prints with the suppliers, because sometimes, you know, people are saying a nice brochure that everything is recyclable, and so on, and we found out, you know, uh, that it was not the case always, and so on, and so on. So, and it's trying to, to change things, you know. Uh, we're working also with activists, you know, so we're working with uh, Planet Patrol, we're working with Surfrider, we're in contact with uh, Shian Sasserland from uh, Planet Plastic and so on and so on. All these people who are trying to change things, you know, legislation, new stuff. So, because I eventually that's what we're looking for, right? To make sure that, guess what? There's more recyclability, you know, in this, for our industry and so on and so on. So that's what we're trying to, uh, awareness and promoting new solutions together and helping each other, helping each other. So I'll just very quickly answer, um, ask you a question that's come up that just says, how can we apply to the ally movement, even if we are a very small brand, but very engaged? You need to you send an email. Okay, to who? Send, <laughs> to me. <laughs> you want to send give your e email out in the public domain? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we will organize, we see with the radio. I mean, absolutely. I mean, you can email me. And then I'm not saying, again, you know, I think we it's a... It's a cool idea, but it's very serious. You know, we we you know it's it, we 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 have a we have a kind of process and so on. So we're vetting people, and you know, and uh, and and we're making sure that uh, that things can be can be done like this. But yeah, I mean, you know, everybody can apply. As I said, it's not uh, it's not a, uh, it's not supposed to be a, um, a private club. The whole idea was to inspire more brands. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that, Salian? 
No, I think I think Arno said it all. It's you know innovation is costly, um, and you know education. Everybody's on a journey in learning. So that generosity of spirit in which you kind of unite against a common goal, um, I think, is really crucial. And, and I think partnerships are very exciting in the beauty industry. What about you, Sarah? I think it's just a really good example of strength in numbers actually and just and I think what what I particularly like about it and it came up earlier because I think someone said you know how do we it, it's such a complex area zero waste and and packaging um that we need to share our knowledge and share best practice and I think this platform does it really really well and I do I like I love this idea of strength in numbers I mean many it's, a, it's different but many years ago I remember Neil's Yard Remedies contacted me um, and invited Pi and, and it was five brands and we, and we joined with Greenpeace to write to David Cameron about microbeads and successfully got the ban through. And it was at a time we thought, you know, and I'll be honest, Pi was minute, it was 2016, I think. We were tiny and, you know, I can promise you if I wrote a letter to David Cameron, it would have had zero impact and wouldn't have got written. I wouldn't wouldn't have got read, but I think the point is is this idea of this coming when when brands join together and unite like this against a common challenge, our planet, it's really powerful and it's very authentic and and it's going to have impact. And I think that's what we need to think about is, you know, to have meaningful impacts at a meaningful pace. This is like the only the way really we have to come together. It has to be a collective movement. It's a brilliant anecdote. And just what, sorry, Sarah, just one thing that I wanted to add is that it's not one size fits all in the alliance, you know, and we're not thinking all, you know, the problems are different. You know, we, we know the goal, we have the same, uh, but some people, we're talking about the OS, some people don't want to talk about the OS, you know, as, a, as an example. Um, some people are, you know, there are brands which are very global and some brands which are very local, so different different problems, right, also. Uh, because when you sell from LA to uh, London, it's uh, it's more complicated than when you you know you sell in uh, just in California and so on. So there's there's other things, uh, but yeah, it's not it's not you know we're not dogmatic. We're not like hey, everybody needs to, to think the way we think. It's not that at all. We initiated, but that's it. You know, it's a it's a living alliance, and uh, and and not everybody. <laughs> I can tell you, we disagree on a lot of things. <laughs> just to be clear, we're competitors, right? So, uh, but but yeah, on the essential stuff, we agree, and we agree that, as as Sarah said, we're stronger together. Yeah. I think you probably end up learning so much from each other that debate and that disagreement probably leads to like brilliant, brilliant solutions. Yeah, and, and a lot of goosebumps. I can tell you because it's it's uh, having been in this industry forever. It's like yeah, it's really exciting to to be able to. You know, there's so many great people in the in this in this industry to meet and to understand the different journeys and what you know the experiences and 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 so on. it's really i mean it's priceless and just that for us in the team has been uh, yeah uh just two people have asked um what was the name of the supplier of the aluminium uh sachets tubex t-u-b-e-x and then the, the other person said does anybody have a contact for tubex Yes, Thanks. we can we can forward something. Yeah, absolutely. But okay. if you look at them, they're very since we launched together, they're very active on LinkedIn. If you follow them on LinkedIn, you're gonna see. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're they're posting a lot. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, but you know that's also the thing, by the way. It's like you know there was not a huge supplier, but you know they played the game with us, and then now they're getting tons of business, and that's great. You know, people they make they they took a risk, and now it's reward. And actually, to that point, a lot of you know, actually one of the things holding brands back was just the lack of packaging supplies that could offer a solution. And I think this the, the change in just I don't know two years. I'm sure you've seen it, Arno, too. Just the change has been quite profound, and and that's great because and we've seen this in organic ingredients and a different place in a way. But where there's demand, that's when things happen, and you, we've got to create this consumer demand. So. Yeah, the, pack, the, the suppliers are a key part of the puzzle. Uh, a quick question, which I trust Laura Hinton to have a brilliant question. Um, what is the one sustainable issue that you wish you could solve in beauty that you currently don't have a solution for? Arno? Uh, <laughs> there, there are a few. It's not, it's not easy. It's uh, we a dropper we cannot we, we cannot find a solution for the dropper you know the pipette that you yeah. have in certain products that yeah. that we we're looking 
uh, we get lots of promises from a lot of people and then and then it breaks so it's not the same product experience so uh, this at the moment uh, i've got a few products like this and we're going to still uh, ask our consumers to say you take the main bottle you put it in the recycling bin mm -hmm. and, the, and the dropper you put it in the normal bin because the dropper cannot be made that cannot be recycled at the moment because it's a, you know it's it's a lot about mo being mono material you know recyclability yeah. and that's the problem with the you know the droppers. And, and to your point on an earlier size becomes really important yes um and they always say when you cut your tubes you should never cut the top of the tube all the way across you leave it so it stays attached to the tube so that you can then because those little bits of plastic you can't won't go through um I, yeah i would agree with the, the certainly that i think one of the the complex areas is the onward recycling of PCR, plastic and sugar cane, because it's not consistent and not clear in terms of it's quite hard to recycle curbside. So from people from home and that to me is a massive block um, because then it's the whole debate of well, is virgin plastic better? Well, no, it's not, obviously, but then it's more easy currently to recycle from your home. Um, so that's one. Um, I mean, my bugbear has always been around um, the regulation piece, really. Um, and there was a Mintel study that Sally, you you referenced, and then I think it's in the same report. There's a, you know, 25%, one in four consumers thinks there's not enough regulation, and and around the, the sort of clarity of messaging and claims and. I just feel like we going back to organic food, which I know a bit more, you know, know quite a bit about. I see what what changed when regulation came in, you know, and it was positive, and positive for the planet, and positive for farmers, and and positive for health. Um, and I just would like to see regulation, more regulation, would be my my one. I think from my perspective, the thing I struggle most with when I'm writing about it or when I'm talking on this morning is how every body has a different sort of recycling rule. Because how do you say to someone, great, you can recycle it. And then you just get like a bombard of tweets saying, I can't recycle that where I live. And that to me is my my biggest sort of I'm so nervous how to word things because th there's no like sort of one line across across board. That's what I struggle with. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and, and you know, all, everything which is you know all the risk, the waste management industry. You know mm. there, there needs to be there needs to be better things done there. I mean, you know I I salute the applaud the, the, the people like TerraCycle, this waste management company, right? And they're doing lots of things. So there's take back programs. You know, take back is really basically being there instead of the council. Basically, you know, you put your own bin, and and TerraCycle is going to do all the 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 sorting that the other guys are not doing, right? Yeah. Because they're not supposed to do it in a way. That's the problem, you know, uh, followed yeah. by Sarah. So, so I think if we can solve this recyclability and and sorting, you know, that's that's going to be a that's going to be a big deal. But that that's a, that's a political issue. Yeah, and that would bring the cost down. We just need to bring the cost of you know terracycle. Oh yes, and... yes, <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how we've but, done this, but it's five o'clock and we haven't even managed to answer everybody's question. So. I don't know if we're allowed to squeeze one more in, should we? I, I better I better do what I'm told. I was told to finish at five o'clock. Um, but thank you all so much uh, for constantly teaching us and really leading the way and showing us um, that change can be done. You, you sort of have to be patient. And I think that's what you guys said is be kind. Like people, the people who are trying, help them rather than call them out. I think that's really, really important. So um, thank you to all of you and I will pass back to Sally now, uh, who will take it from there. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, that absolutely is the message loud and clear about this collaboration and togetherness is the thing that's gonna help us make change. Um, and thank you so much everybody for joining us. All of our attendees, it's been our biggest um, session for many months actually, which is, is obviously an indication of interest in the area. Thank you, Sally Ann and the team at Spring, of course, to Sarah Jossel and Sarah Brown and to Arno. Um, I really do believe that these kind of collaborative events and discussions are such a positive step for all of the businesses in our industry, whatever their size or wherever they sit. 
Um, and of course, we'll be continuing to have to stage many more of these to give everybody access to them as the, as the months go by. I think our next one is with the Soil Association during Organic Beauty Week, which I think is the 8th or 9th of September. So we'll start talking about that soon. And then towards the end of September, beginning of October, we're doing an event with Cruelty Free International to talk about animal testing and how brands can, can um, participate there. So um, it's an onward conversation and um, please keep us in touch. If there's anything specific that you feel that we'd like, you'd like us to do, uh, let us know. We're gonna distribute the report that um, Spring kindly shared earlier on um, on the CW website tomorrow. So that will be available for everybody. And if you have any particular questions or if we haven't managed to get to your questions, I'm so sorry about that. We will be back. So there'll be more opportunities to do so. But for now, good evening, have a lovely time, have a nice glass of water, G&T, glass of rosé, or whatever your chosen tipple is, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>